Today we're going to talk about research, what it is, how to get involved in it, and it will be philosophical at the beginning, and I know that will annoy some of you. Uh, then it will very quickly get to practical uh, approaches to how to find an advisor, how to find funding, how to write an email to get into a lab to maximize your success in doing so. And I should say that these are not going to be the absolute way that everyone has ever found their research um, position, how everyone has found their advisor, but it's, they are ways that you can kind of dial up the probability that you will find the, uh, the position or the topic that you want to explore. I had no idea that universities did research until I was a senior in high school when my AP chemistry class went to the University of Rochester, where in my hometown, actually I grew up um, in a town northwest of Rochester where you had to drive through cornfields in every direction to get to the next town. And I didn't, my, my dad didn't go to college. My mom went to college in the 60s for visual art. And I didn't know anything about the sciences and research and um, how, things, how things worked. I didn't know that grad students predominantly got paid to do research. Uh, I didn't know that undergrads had the ability to, to do research. And so when I found out in this, uh, I visited this chemistry lab at the University of Rochester, and I think they were working on like organic semiconductors at the time, which are of course semiconductors that are grass-fed, pesticide-free, no, just kidding. Mm -hmm. They are carbon-based semiconductors and they're the basis for organic light emitting displays and TVs and things and displays on your phone and your watch sometimes that are basically carbon-based things that emit light. And so I didn't, uh, I didn't appreciate what, uh, you know, what, what that was. I didn't know that, that, you, that they got paid at the time $17,000 a year. That seemed crazy to me. Um, seems like a ridiculous number now, um, but that was the going rate back then. And so fast forward a couple years to when I was a chemistry major, physics minor at Boston University after cycling through majors of biomedical engineering and anthropology. Long story, I ended up in chemistry with a minor in physics and I wanted to do research. And I looked at our, the menu of summer research oppor opportunities and there was this program called the Beckman Scholars Program. And it's one of many that my campus had available, like UC San Diego has available, where you can apply to those programs as an undergraduate and get paid to do research, which is a type of learning aligned employment, right? So you're doing research, it is related to the stuff you're learning in class and you get to apply that knowledge to create more knowledge in say a laboratory or the library or an art studio or a music studio environment. I was super intimidated when I applied for a research position for the first time because I had no idea what it was, what I would be doing day to day, if I would get there and not know anything and feel ignorant, right? Like I would feel like I didn't know what I was doing. I remember stepping into the lab that I eventually ended up joining and this is this would happen to be a chemistry lab but the same is true in in any circumstance you're going into an engineering lab you're going into a graphic design lab you're going into uh to to a theater for the first time um, and you are trying to do some kind of scholarly learning there and it's sensory overload like you don't know you're just kind of dropped in the middle of an ocean and you have the perception that someone's just just gonna say here's a problem figure this out or worse I don't know what problem you should figure out figure out what the problem is and then figure out how to solve it but that's generally not how it is there will be a, a network of mentors in place from the graduate students to other undergraduates to postdocs sometimes to professional research scientists and the professor 
who is kind of directing that research topic. This is also sometimes where you might have heard the phrase the imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is a phenomenon that happens with bright people who see who are in a new environment and because they're they have a lot of intellectual ability they apply that intellectual uh, that uh, that perception on themselves and they figure out all of their their flaws and all the reasons why they don't belong in this particular scenario and that's very happens to pretty much everybody who shows up in a research environment for the first time you always ask yourself the question, do I know enough? Did my classes teach me enough to prepare me enough for this extracurricular or co-curricular activity that I know I'm gonna get a lot out of, but it's just a really difficult step to go from classroom learning to experiential learning, which is what research is. So what what is research? No, it's my 75 cent piece of chalk. What is research? Creating knowledge, creating knowledge. Research is the process by which knowledge is creating, created. Creating knowledge, what's, what's knowledge? <laughs> what's knowledge? Knowledge are, knowledge is mental representations. They are representations in consciousness. I knew I figured out a good way to say it in my notes. Representations in consciousness. Consciousness. I know I was gonna, I told you I was gonna get annoyingly philosophical at the beginning when what you want is how to find a research lab, but I'll get there. I'll get there quickly, I promise. Creating knowledge. What is creating in the context of knowledge? New facts? What's a new fact? Was F equals MA a fact before Newton wrote it down. Yeah, in a way it was, but it's, it's a new fact in that it created a new representation in consciousness. Also connections. Connections between facts. So you might learn that Jane Austen, I'm totally making this up, as you can see, literature is not my field, that Jane Austen was influenced by a particular passage in a Jonathan Swift book, and that this thread of intellectual history is related to much else that flourished in, uh, in, in literature. Totally making that up, totally making that up. Stick, I know I should just stick to chemistry, right? Okay, how do you, how do you, create, uh, how do you create new facts? Well, by observation, experiment, and modeling. And I mean this in the most broad possible terms. Observation. Experiment, modeling. You might have heard of the scientific method, like in fifth grade, they put the scientific method in the corner of the room and it says you observe something in the environment, you form a hypothesis about why that, that occurs, that is a 
mental model, your hypothesis. You have some mechanism for why it occurs that you're testing. You test it through controlled observations of the environment, either through sociological experiments where you control for similar variables, or you set up an experiment in a lab in cases where it's possible to do so. Then you see if your findings are consistent with your hypothesis. And if they are, it supports your hypothesis. And if they aren't, it may falsify your hypothesis. These three aspects are all interconnected in this way. By modeling, I don't mean Plato models, although I, or Lego models, although I sometimes may mean that. Modeling can be a lot of things. You can have an implicit, an implicit model. Say it's your gut feeling about something. You might have a formal hypothesis. You might have an explicit model. Explicit model could also be related to your hypothesis. Your explicit model could be analytical. Analytical could mean solving an equation. Say you're modeling something with an equation, like the trajectory of an arrow flying through the sky. It could also be graphical. Graphical or visual, a visual model for something. It could be numerical. Analytical, graphical, numerical, these could all be done with a computer or without a computer. It could, you could use whatever tool you wanted to generate an explicit model. If you think about it, sorry, I'll get really philosophical here. Everything is a model. What is matter? Empty space, predominantly empty space, right? And a nucleus is here. And the electron, if the nucleus is this side, the electron might be at the wall. Everything is empty space, but we don't see empty space. We see solid objects. We feel solid objects, even though it's empty space. Well, we can't, we don't have the machinery in our eyes to see what's really happening. So the representation and consciousness of this room is itself a model. So we have to trust that this pyramid, a good kind of pyramid, this pyramid of knowledge that builds one on top of the other can be trusted when it puts, when it's all put together to produce a reasonable model of the world that people can, can agree on, which is accurate. And that's what a fact kind of is. <laughs> so we think of facts as being very, very set in stone, but facts are really contingent on us believing each other and believing our senses and believing tools that we make to augment our senses. Knowledge is cool because the more knowledge you have, the more it's possible to create. The more, no the more knowledge you have, the more it's possible to know as well. And why is that? Because if you have knowledge here and here and here, but you wanna know how to get here, you have to make a big leap. Say these are outposts in an ocean. You have to swim a long time to get to this outpost, to get to this place where there is no outpost in the ocean. But if you have a lot of knowledge, if you have more knowledge, then you can go from here to here to here to here, and it becomes easier to find this unknown place.
how does that work in operation? The more knowledge you have, the more it's possible to create. The first mechanism is through vocabulary. Vocabulary, I don't just mean how did you study for the SAT or your French vocab test. I mean, what is the word for the thing and what else does it mean? What else does it imply? How much effective complexity is there in a, in a word? And this is, so I mean specifically linguistics and the way that linguistics and language processing in the brain leads to creativity. The more you know, the more it's possible to learn has to do with the concept of effective complexity. The word atom, A-T-O-M, means something different to a person who heard the word atom in fifth grade science class versus somebody who is a professor in chemistry or physics. It's the same word, but in one context, it has a lot more effective complexity. And it's more than just naming the word, okay, that's what it is. Even the model itself has more effective complexity because there are more waypoints in that person's, that person's mental representation about what an atom is. The effective complexity of ideas, effective complexity of ideas. How do you judge the effective complexity of an idea? Well, there, no word has an effective complexity by itself. It only has an effective complexity based on your own intellectual background, your own background in learning. When I, so I have a four and a half year old daughter and she always asks, why, 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 why? And you, and I'll, I'll totally indulge that behavior and I'll go to quantum mechanics if I have to. <laughs> and the effect of complexity is how far down the why chain can you go? Why, 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 why? Okay, this all sounds like science. Is, re is all research science? Well, maybe, depending on how we, how we want to define things. I tend to think of science as a, maybe a subset of research that uses tools to get at observations that we can't make with our senses. What do I mean? If I'm an archaeologist and I don't have access to plane tickets and picks and shovels and knowledge of ancient history, then I'm not going to be a very effective archaeologist. But if I have tools, if I have access to things that I wouldn't normally be able to see in my everyday life, that's what makes it science. If I'm a material scientist or a, or a biologist, I need a microscope to learn about cell structure, to learn about these things. So this is what differentiates scientific exploration of a topic versus stuff that you can do with your own senses and your own everyday reasoning. But in some ways, we're practicing the scientific method all the time. Let's say you buy a new toaster and you put your piece of bread in there 
and you set it at number one and it comes out and the bread is still cold <laughs> and you set it at number five and it's burned yeah then okay number three is going to be fine did you not make an observation have a hypothesis test it and fail to falsify your observation is that science Eh. Maybe it is. Does it matter? Not really. But I think it's generally understood in society that science requires tools. It requires a different vantage point. It re may require training to understand what that instrument what that scientific instrument or acoustic instrument or visual arts medium is going to produce two weeks ago i did kind of a survey of the class as to where everyone was coming from in terms of their degree program uh, major and i think i'm going to cover everyone on the list but like if you think about how everything arises and maybe as a homework assignment you can draw your own your own chart here that shows the interconnectivity of every basically every branch of of learning at a university but here's how i would do it let's say you have physics chemistry is built using the laws of physics biology is built using the laws of chemistry predominantly and bio you get neuroscience bio you also get medicine From neuroscience, you get psychology. From psychology, you get economics. You get sociology. You get education. And we sometimes call these the social sciences. But then you get even more from psychology, from emotion, cognition, sensory information, processing. You get music. You get visual art. You get literature. Examples of the humanities. Where does technology, technology or engineering, technology and engineering, of course, gets a lot of its information from physics, chemistry, biology, and psychology, and then it's used to enable things right so you have film because you have a camera you have visual art you have painting because you have paint then you have ways of representing ways of communicating in these fields i.e. math language you might be tempted to put language and the branch of psychology known as linguistics together but in any case you need these concepts to tie everything else together what's the what's the why of research well if you put 
human creative output in a, uh, in a pyramid structure. And you have research, research, and discovery form the base. Research and discovery form the base upon which everything is built, upon which upon which human development is largely built. So we'll put development next. Again, you could come up with your own hierarchy here. Then above development, we have output. This could be any kind of output. For example, technology. And then at the top of the pyramid, the oils, fats, and sweets of like the food pyramid that I grew up with is support. Support decisions, policy decisions, resource allocation. So public policy is built on research and discovery in the, in the natural sciences and the social sciences that have been developed into outputs and technologies. And now we have this new set of circumstances that has been a new context that has been built on fundamental research, which is the purview of the university. And now we have this new situation and we need to figure out how we're gonna cope with it as a society and what needs to be invested in and how our learning informs all of this. Okay, philosophy lesson is over. How do you get involved in this? Was that at least entertaining? Okay. <laughs> The research and development part. How do you get involved in this base of the pyramid? And I think that is why you decided to come here. I think many of you were interested in UCSD because of the opportunities to participate in stuff that happens in the floors above the classroom level <laughs> in the buildings. What happens in the floors above the ground floor. So what do you get if you do research? Well, you can get course credit. You get marketable skills. Marketable skills, things that an employer might look for, things that somebody might pay you to do. Um, to, to develop uh, an economic security for yourself and your loved ones. You are creating, you're creating a portfolio independent, independent of your transcript or your GPA. You're creating this co-curricular activity. You're creating this book of stuff that you did, that you helped to bring into existence that could be much more important than your GPA. Does it mean that when you're applying for things, it's going to eliminate people's paying attention to your GPA? No, but it's something else that you can use to differentiate yourself in a crowded job market. There is a chance to get paid as an undergraduate.
do you get paid as an undergraduate doing research? Most universities have some kind of office, office of undergraduate research opportunities programs called Europ. Here, we like to be different. We have a different name for it. It's called the Undergraduate Research Hub. The U R H. Undergrad Research Hub. And these have a lot of opportunities, most of which are for the summer. Most of which are for the summer. Unfortunately, we don't quite have, no university quite has a system in place to pay as in a work study for students doing undergraduate research, but there are exceptions. What are some exceptions? In California, we have something called the Learning Aligned Employment Program, LAPE, LEAP spelled wrong. And this is based on financial need. So they will look up your FAFSA application and figure out if you qualify for this. If you've been in the lab for a while, your PI, that is your principal investigator or your faculty advisor, might have a grant. They might have a grant from a federal funding agency, from a state funding agency, from a company, from philanthropic support. They might have some internal money from campus. And the PI could pay you directly as a research assistant. PI is just in the lexicon of research. PI means professor. How do you find out? How do you find out about research opportunities? Well, first place is that the Undergraduate Research Hub collects research opp opportunities that are posted by faculty members, but that's only going to catch the people who, who bother or remember <laughs> to submit their position to the Undergrad Research Hub. And that's going to be some less than half of all research opportunities. In your department, you might get a department email blast. <laughs> we call it a blast is like a spam. <laughs> it's a department email spam where we say such and such a lab has positions open here, here, and here. You can apply for it. And um, I know that email is becoming an increasingly ineffective way to communicate with people um, because there are so many different channels that we have coming at us in social media and text and whatever. But try to read more of those and you'll find some stuff because the, the older people at the university, myself included, still think that people read every email. <laughs> Finally, chatting with your professors at office hours, TAs, discussion leaders, so word of mouth. TAs are also a great resource. This is kind of an, an, an unsung method of getting an, undergrad, getting an undergraduate research position is if you go to your TA's office hours, it's going to be in a class very likely in your major. That TA, if they're a graduate student, is doing research themselves and may have a position open on their project, or they might be willing to mentor you. You might be, if you develop a uh, 
you know, a good academic relationship with that person, they might invite you to apply to the, to the lab or just say, I want to work with you on this. Would you be interested? I have this project available. And then the graduate students PI, since all the vetting is done, the, the PI might just tell the TA, the graduate student, oh, you want to mentor this undergraduate student? That's great. Yeah, go ahead and take them. Done. Eliminates all that like awkward work of knocking on doors and sending random emails to professors. How do you find out about what research is going on here? Like, how do you know how your interests align with the research interests of the faculty? This is becoming a lot easier than it used to be when I was an undergraduate. Nowadays, most PIs have at least one talk on YouTube where they talk about what they do. And they're usually explaining it to a broader audience. And you can find those, uh, those talks. So finding out about research topics, YouTube, podcasts, you can search Spotify or Apple or Google Podcasts for UCSD research. And just flip through and look at the titles and the descriptions. Sometimes there will be popular articles. By popular articles, I mean newspaper articles. I mean articles in Scientific American, or if you're at the library and you see a copy of Science or Nature sitting out, the first half of those magazines are all about people's research, but written in a kind of a journalistic way as opposed to in a technical way. And then finally, in the scholarly literature, you have review, or tutorial uh, articles. And you can find these on, now what's a review or a tutorial article? A review or tutorial article is an article that was written by a researcher for sophisticated non-experts for educated non-experts, for people that are looking to get into a field. The more tutorial the thing looks, the better it's gonna be, I think, for someone who's entering a field for the first time. How do you find these articles? Uh, Google Scholar. And there's a subscription service that if you're on the UCSD network or VPN, you can access, which is Web of Science. Science interpreted broadly. A lot of fields are represented on Web of Science and you can click the box that says like tutorial, like it says article type, click on tutorial, review, perspective, and those are the articles that you want to look at. And then use whatever search terms if you're interested in nanotechnology in cancer, or you're interested in artificial intelligence for education, or you are interested in virtual reality in theater. Those are the types of terms that you would mix and match with this type of article. Finally, how do you, how do you apply? How do you apply? First, don't, don't apply unless you know, unless you figured out what the logic is for you wanting that particular position. Because the surest way to get a non-response is to say, I want this position because it will look good on my resume. <laughs> and that seems silly but 
you would be surprised at how easy it is to be a little specific and be above, way above the median email that we get. Generally not from UCSD students, but certainly from people everywhere in the world who want positions in labs at an R1. So what is the logic? How do you know what the logic is? You have to feel interested in the topic and you have to convey that in the email or in the, the appointment. So you make an appointment with a professor to meet with them, to tell them in person. Usually that starts with an email. You can describe why this topic interests you. Maybe there's a personal reason why you're interested in it. Maybe you read a book as a teenager that was about this topic. Ask the person questions about it could be a good strategy. Like, I'm curious as to why you found this. Or I'm curious as to why you yourself got into this topic. That's a good one because it really <laughs> massages the person's ego because people love talking about themselves. And the number, one, the number one rule of social psychology is to get someone to do what you want them to do, you have to make them want to do it. <laughs> you have to make them want to meet with you. And, we, and that is through demonstration of curiosity. You have to show that you have time to devote to it and whether or not you may need financial support to do it. Now, it's probably too early in the conversation to say, I absolutely can't do this job unless you have money for me because that's probably not gonna work. Um, but being as upfront as possible about whether or not you have the bandwidth to take on a 12 to 16 hour a week potentially volunteer position is gonna be a, a factor. And it's something that you have to have a good idea about before, uh, before sending in an application or an email.